he interacted uh, with all the senior faculty members at that point of time probably when he was the uh, director at iit madras um, later he occupied the position of acd chairman and also he was the member of many uh, academic bodies at uh, national level uh, and also interacted with uh, many members of the committees and uh, formulated many policies uh, which was very much useful for the country uh, in fact we are very we are very fortunate enough in the light of this uh, uh, he, in fact whenever we approached him through our uh, our r and d advisor uh, dr dr prasad uh, prasad raj garu he immediately accepted to interact with our uh, uh, faculty members are one of the themes that is uh, national education policy 2020 uh, in fact we are very happy uh, happy sir Uh, in fact the government of india has brought out this new education policy 2020 with a uh, vision with a forward vision to improve the quality of technical and higher education system in this country because when we compete with the rest of the world the innovation the creative outcomes that are coming out of this colleges and universities are very very less so keeping that point in the mind the government as considered a committee and uh, formulated a policy which will really churn out the creative individuals who will come out with the scientific innovations through through that scientific innovations also manufacturing some of the products presently which we are depending on the other countries in the form of uh, what you call that uh, uh, importing the uh, goods and services which is uh, which is very very Uh, where we are spending uh, lakhs and that is millions of dollars of foreign currency so with this point in mind with this point in mind the government has came out with new education policy how it is going to bring reforms what kind of re reforms really we require how this policy is going to promote and inculcate the these reforms which are very much useful to develop the creative individuals and also how this policy will energize and motivate the uh, uh, faculty members really drive this ecosystem in the institutions so with this uh, in fact sir just uh, before concluding my uh, introductory remarks uh, this institution was established in the year 1977 sir so since 1998 we have been continuously implementing all our engineering programs sir um, even recent up to june 2021 all our programs are in the accreditation status sir we have accredited our pg programs also once sir again we have been going for accreditation of all our engineering programs both uc and pg uh, and uh, our institution as a whole accredited in 2013 with uh, by nac at a grade sir now we are uh, the visit is pending because of this pandemic visit is pending by the nac team uh, we, again so it is uh, at to be scheduled sir and our is a zero recognized institution techy funded institution and uh, recently our institution was ranked at 156 by nirf last year in 2019 it's 177 171 and uh, for the past 4 years we are in the nirf band sir and uh, most more than 70 to 75% students uh, are placed in the campus our highest package in the last couple of years is 28 lakhs by amazon so likewise uh it is a well reputed institution in the coastal region of andhra pradesh uh similarly uh, our department of civil engineering in fact received during the last year 2019 aict is a best industry institute uh, industry institute attraction award by aict and cia in 2019 uh, in the by the department of civil engineering so likewise it is a, a fairly reputed institution and competing with the rest of peer institutions in the country sir so with these few words i once again thank you sir for accepting our invitation to be part of this uh, uh, program uh, the, that is webinar uh, that is implementation of national education policy 2020 so i before you initiate your interaction i request one of my colleague uh, dr g sinivas rao to introduce the expert dr r natarajan gar thank you sir sorry good morning to everyone 
uh, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk us about implementation on new education policy he worked in various positions such as a former chairman ACTE from 2001 to 2004 former director IIT Madras from 1995 to 2001 and former professor in mechanical engineering IIT Madras from 1973 to 2000 his education qualifications are phd from university of uh, waterloo canada in 1970 msc from university of waterloo canada in 1965 me mechanical engineering from institute of science from indian institute of science bangalore in 1963 B.E. Mechanical Engineering from University College of Engineering, Bangalore, in 1961. His major professional accomplishments uh, in his illustrious career of uh, over five decades, he made stellar contributions in research and teaching in the areas of combustion, pollution, energy, and environment. He brought in significant reforms in technical education and improved quality of education through various measures. Uh, and he is the chairman of the research council of the CSIR Central Fuel Research Institute Dhanbad from 1995 to 2005 uh, chairs the board of IT education standards of Karnataka and member of the editorial boards of Fuel London AS EE journal of engineering education and several other journals of I repute uh, awards and major professional recognitions selectively are He has been conferred several awards and honors, including Dr. Homi J. Baba Award by the Indian uh, Science Congress in 2002, awarded gold medal by System Society of India in 2002, uh, Best Wood Outstanding Contribution Award for Quality in Education by the Quality Circle Forums of India, conferred Eminent Engineer Award by the Institution of Engineers India, conferred Honorary Doctorate. by the university of south australia jawaharlal nehru technical university hyderabad kanpur university nagarjuna university ap uh, purvanchal university uttar pradesh and nit agartala i welcome sir professor r natarajan thank you thank, thank you professor shrinivas rao thank you very much to our principal professor ratna prasad uh, i remember coming to your institution some years ago many years ago actually and uh, your institution has a very good reputation among uh, all the indian uh, engineering colleges let me congratulate you on your accomplishment in this brief talk i will uh, speak about four things first i will give you the highlights of uh, the national education policy 2020 then i will talk about the major comments made by can you see it can you see my slides hello not, not it sir no can no not it sir slides? okay yeah you, yes. you can see my slides no sir no, not it sir i am making you the host sir one minute sir one second you going to make me my the host yes yes sir share screen okay sir you need to share the screen sir i'm looking for the icon at the bottom of the screen you find the share screen sir share screen button at the moment i don't yeah okay can you now see no not yet not, not yet sir i thought i thought we had checked this uh, yes sir yes sir now we can see your screen sir you can see my screen yes so oh, i will uh... now start presentations that's it 
Sir, uh, open the uh, PowerPoint presentation, sir. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. We got it, sir. Okay. Now it is uh, filled up the screen. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Okay. There are four aspects of uh, the national education policy that I wanted to cover, but um, your presentation is too long. Does not matter. The first is I'll give you the highlights, major highlights of the. National Education Policy 2020. Then I will give you a brief account of the viewpoints of uh, many educationists and also experts on uh, the pros and cons of uh, this policy. The third part of my talk, I will speak about the major implementation efforts of uh, the government of India. A lot of things have happened since the policy was accepted by the union cabinet in July of uh, 2020. A lot of things have happened. Then the final section, I look at some major transformations in higher and technical education in the country. I don't think I will be able to cover it. I won't bother about it, but I will leave the presentation with you so that uh, you can uh, take a look at it a later on. Right? Okay. So this is the official document of the government of India, the Ministry of Human Resource Development. Even at this point of time, I will tell you that the name has been changed as a result of this policy. It is not, no longer Ministry of HRD, it is the Ministry of Education. Okay, it has a vision. The new policy has a vision. The National Education Policy 2019 was the draft uh, policy uh, release. So we talked about 2019. Envisions an India-centered education system that contributes directly to transforming our na nation sustainably into an equitable and vibrant knowledge society by providing high quality education to all. You remember that under uh, UPA 2 and before that, India was considered to be changed into, transformed into a knowledge superpower. It was a little bit of hype. Therefore, now they are calling it equitable and vibrant knowledge society. Now, let me take you through the major transformational reforms in the education sector since we got independence 70 years ago. Major changes, uh, major uh, progress of our national education policies. The University Education Commission in 1948, Secondary Education Commission, then the very famous Kothari Education Commission, which actually implemented a large number of changes. The national policy in education first came in 1968, and there was a 42nd constitutional amendment in 1976, which put education in the concurrent list. Basically what it means is both the state government as well as the central government have equal responsibility, equal or whatever, the responsibility and accountability for changing the education system. Then the important national policy on education, NPE, it was announced in 1986. It, it uh, suggested major reforms. Many of them have been implemented. To tell you uh, one thing, it actually uh, proposed uh, the AICT to become a, a statutory body with the powers to control education in many respects. 1986, the AICT was uh, constituted in 1987. NPA modified in 1992, the major changes were a decrease in the total number of uh, competitive examinations for admission to institutions. Then the TSR Subramaniam Committee report was uh, released in 2016. Uh, it made major changes. Uh, unfortunately, TSR is uh, not alive anymore. And the latest is the Dr. K. Kasturirangan Committee, which the report was submitted in May 2019, and it has been approved by the cabinet in July 2019. There was a, a comprehensive consultation process with many stakeholders. I won't go to the details, but it was indeed disseminated to a large number of bodies and their feedback was obtained in order to make any necessary corrections. The draft uh, summary was also published uh, in 22, we have 22 official languages, and it was also made into an audio book. The Parliamentary Standing Committee 
on HRD, it uh, received information about the policy in November 2019. That was a necessary condition. What are the major reforms that have been suggested in this policy? I'll let me quickly go through it. Gross enrollment ratio to increase to 50 to be increased to 50% by 2035. I will look at the implications of uh, some of these uh, proposals a little later on. And a holistic and multidisciplinary education, you will hear this term uh, often used. They would like to all our uh, universities to become multidisciplinary universities. Multiple entry exits, a three or four year undergraduate program, integrated five year bachelor's or master's, MPhil is going to be discontinued, credit transfer and academic banking of uh, credits, and uh, yeah, a few, a few other changes. Graded autonomy, autonomy meaning in the sectors of academic autonomy, administrative and financial autonomy, this is an important uh, recommendation, phasing out the affiliation system in 15 years. Uh, Professor Ratna Prasad pointed out that you were at Equip Institution and you know that one of the preconditions for giving uh, uh, this project to institutions was that they should actually become autonomous institutions. They should uh, become free from the affiliating university. But uh, let me tell you that uh, only about uh, 30% of the institutions actually were given autonomy by the corresponding state governments. It's a difficult, uh, complex situation, but in the new policy, it is suggested that this affiliating system should be removed, should be replaced by autonomous system in 15 years. They have given themselves 15 years. Uh, and uh, public investment in education sector to reach 6% of GDP at the earliest. If you remember, this is a recommendation by most of the education policies and the educators, but it has not yet reached 6%. It is only about three to 4%. And also another very important uh, recommendation and much work has been done to bring it into practice. It re this requires a parliamentary act, setting up of a national research foundation, NRF, internationalization, then um, MHRD, to be, MHRD to be renamed as Ministry of Education, which has been done now. The principles of this policy, uh, very uh, lofty ideas, purpose of the education system, and this can be taken by any country in fact, is to develop good human beings capable of rational thought and action, possessing compassion and empathy, courage and resilience, scientific temper and creative imagination with sound ethical moorings and values. A very lofty statement. And uh, what will it uh, produce? It will produce engaged, productive and contributing citizens for building an equitable, inclusive and plural society. This is what our constitution uh, demands. These are some very important uh, concepts. They define a good educational system. What is a good educational system? It is an institution in, in which every student feels welcomed and cared for, where a safe and stimulating learning environment exists, where a wide range of learning experiences are offered, and where, where good physical infrastructure and appropriate resources conducive to learning are available to all students. So this should be the goal of every educational institution. It is a good uh, recommendation for all institutions to follow. When you define your strategic plan and your vision and mission, then this should be kept in mind. Now, th th there are sections on primary education and secondary education, school education, but uh, we are interested in higher education and therefore I will look at aspects of higher education a new and forward-looking vision for India's higher education system. Worldwide, it is uh, recognized that higher education is very important for producing productive uh, uh, graduates and uh, uh, postgraduates who will contribute to national economic and social and uh, uh, development. They are essential if it has to progress economically and uh, socially. So as India moves towards the knowledge economy and society, this was a term used by under the previous government. So it has given importance here also, then what we need are uh, high quality, um, 
higher education institutions and individuals. They've also identified the major problems currently faced by our higher education system. All of us in this system, we know that these uh, problems exist and uh, we need to reinforce the good things that have happened and we remove the obstacles to becoming a, a quality higher education system. So what are the major problems? A severely fragmented higher educational ecosystem, less emphasis on the development of cognitive skills and learning outcomes. See, learning outcomes have become an important uh, a term in accreditation, as you know, both nationally as well as internationally. So what are the important or learning outcomes? Not so much what goes into the system. This is another important thing, uh, a rigid separation of disciplines, and the early specialization and streaming of students into narrow areas of study. This has been identified to be an important problem that needs to be solved. Uh, limited access in uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged areas and autonomy, teacher autonomy, institutional autonomy. Therefore, the following key changes in the current system are being proposed. Moving towards the higher educational system consisting of large, multi large to the extent of up to 20,000 students, multidisciplinary universities and colleges, and uh, to have at least one in or near every district. Therefore, uh, this will increase the enhance the enrollment ratio. Moving towards a more multidisciplinary undergraduate education, faculty and institutional economy, um, autonomy, enhanced student experience, and the establishment of an NRF National Research Foundation to fund outstanding peer-reviewed research. <laughs> Governance is an important thing that we are focusing on, and institutions will be given autonomy to the extent that there will be self-governing institution. Light but tight is a term used in this policy more than once, and essentially what it means is light meaning the uh, nature of the regulations will, will not uh, constrain the institutions from moving towards innovative institutions, but tight meaning enforcement, enforcement will be tight. Like a regulator for higher education is the transformations that have been proposed to increase the access equity and inclusion and also look at ODL, the open distance learning uh, you know, I, we had, uh, we have gone through stages where this was discouraged. Even the employers were not happy with uh, graduates coming out of uh, the open universities, for instance. But uh, in this policy, because of the pandemic, what we are doing now is not face-to-face -face interaction, but through technology. And uh, this it will be promoted, it will also be respected, and also look at uh, learners with disabilities. Now, here is the important section in terms of higher education. Transforming the regulatory system of higher education. At the moment, our two major regulators are AICT and UGC. But you will see that major changes are being proposed, and AICT and UGC will be merged into a much larger system of regulation. Uh, let me go through this. The fault that is being found is that too much has been attempted to be regulated with too little effect. I, I, having been a regulator for three years, I don't think I'll accept this, but in any case, this is the general feeling that uh, they have that too much has been attempted to be regulated with too little effect. Mm -hmm. And heavy concentrations of power within a few bodies, and, um, leading to conflicts of interest among these mm -hmm. bodies. I'm not sure that this adapt UGC and AICT, we have been working together in a very cordial fashion. But anyway, this is the general feeling uh, through some feedback. A complete overhaul they are planning to do. There are four major activities or areas uh, or functions in uh, regulation of higher education. Regulation, accreditation, funding, and academic standard setting. Therefore, they will have four different bodies, the verticals that they call them, uh, to be performed by distinct, independent, and empowered bodies. The four functions are important. It will eliminate the concentrations of power. So there is an umbrella organization or an institution that they are talking about, and this is the Higher Education Commission of India. If you remember, 
under the previous government when the national knowledge commission was making recommendations they talked about an nchr national council for higher education and research so this is an equivalent body uh, the new body is the higher education commission of india there are four verticals the first vertical is the national higher education regulatory council we have to get used to this uh, uh, nomenclature and the uh, acronyms n h e r c national higher education regulatory council it will function as the common single point regulator for higher education sector including teacher education but excluding medical and legal education thus eliminating the duplication and disjunction of regulatory efforts by multiple regulatory agencies this will require uh, repealing of existing acts and formul formulating new acts uh, but the important point is that it will be a single point umbrella organization for regulation it is to facilitate the light but tight uh, i pointed out light meaning that uh, the uh, regulation will not be uh, too com detailed uh, there will be amount of discretion which will be permitted but tight meaning whatever is proposed will be enforced very strictly in a facilitative manner particularly functions uh, and activities that uh, will be required to be looked at by this body is yes, financial probity good governance and things like that the second vertical will be a meta accrediting body it will be called the national accreditation council nac not naac but nac it will uh, include uh, the accreditation of all types of institutions it's again as in any accreditation body it will look at basic norms public self disclosure and things like that like in techquip all hei hei is higher education institution will be asked to develop their own institutional development plans those who are in techquip you know are very familiar with what this means you define for yourself what your development plan what your strategic plan what your Uh, objectives are mission and vision are so essentially to attain the highest level of accreditation over the next 15 years in any case the grades are going to be removed we had in aict as you remember first abc now it is 5 years and three you know palm the point to elaborate is as an international practice a binary just for the third vertical is the higher education grants council it is the expansion of ugc university uh, grants council uh, commission and it will assist in funding and financial fourth vertical will be the general education council which will be uh, a comprehensive body and it will frame expected learning outcomes for higher education programs the learning outcomes you are familiar if you have gone through uh, nba accreditation and they are also called graduate attributes at the moment you know that we have a national skills qualifications framework nsqf correspondingly there will be for education a national higher education qualification from framework the, it is a parallel stream of qualifications and these two will work in tandem what about the professional council many professional councils we have indian council for agricultural research veterinary council national council for teacher education council of architecture pharmacy council of india ncvet and so on they will be now they will now become professional standard setting <laughs> professional standard setting bodies pssb hello they will work along with uh, the uh, <laughs> educational institutions in order to enhance the objectives of uh, these councils but they will not have any regulatory role at the moment you know the coa and the pharmacy council of india they have uh, uh, they play a considerable part in the regulation of uh, the pro that those particular professions but at the, here they will only be professional standard setting bodies and they will have no regulatory role this has been a very important uh, uh, area of uh, conflict uh, between private and public institutions 
and from the beginning it has been said that higher education is a not for profit uh, activity mm -hmm. and any excess of uh, income over expenditure should be plowed back into the institution so this will be a key, key priority of the regulatory system and many checks and balances will be placed in order to prevent the commercialization of education the other important activity which we realized under tequip which is an important consideration for enhancement of quality of institutions is effective governance and leadership. So they are making many recommendations to uh, empower the institutions to govern themselves. Online and digital education, which are becoming very important in the current pandemic uh, era, ensuring equitable use of technology. Uh, realize that uh, technology, uh, digital technology, educational technology have important roles to play. And uh, many things which used to happen in a, a different manner, face to face, for example, that they will now be replaced by uh, the use of uh, technology. We have at the moment several online teaching platform and tools. I'm sure many of your faculty members must be using them. One is Swayam, Swayam which is a Hindi acronym that stands for study webs of active learning for young aspiring minds. This is essentially a MOOC. Uh, it's an Indian MOOC, Massive Open Online Course. It uh, comprises uh, several uh, uh, detailed platforms. For example, uh, the technology and learning platform that uh, IITs have uh, created. So this includes all those things, but more of uh, these uh, MOOCs. Diksha is another platform for enabling teachers to do their jobs better. That will also be enhanced and be made to be available 24 by seven, both, both these platforms. You know, we have in India a, a tremendous digital divide. There are regions where uh, internet uh, access is not uh, good, where there are several uh, aspects of technology which are not available to individual students, for example, they do not own their own laptops and uh, desktops. So what we, India has been following many years ago, as you remember, many decades ago, ISRO had a site project, Satellite Instructional Television uh, Televised Education. That achieved a great deal of, uh, it was a pilot project that achieved a great deal of success. So television, radio, and community radio will be used as uh, important technology devices to spread, disseminate education, including higher education throughout the country. There are three important aspects in education. One is uh, teaching, learning. Then, then there is the uh, teaching, learning, uh, content curriculum, and assessment. Assessment is extremely important, and they are suggesting several reliable, credible activities in assessment. And the acronym used for assessment is PARAC, Performance, Assessment, Review, and Analysis for Holistic Development. Blended models of learning, both online as well as face-to-face, -face, that is becoming the norm in many institutions, even globally. Laying down standards of content, technology, and pedagogy to assure minimum levels of quality. That is more or less the basic highlights of the content of the policy. What should be done, but how it should be done, and also to make sure that uh, the desired results are achieved. It is all a matter of implementation, making it happen. At least three major policy, uh, policy uh, initiatives they are suggesting. Strengthening the Central Advisory Board of Education, CABE, which is the apex body for, uh, uh, for ensuring quality in, in education, education, including higher education. The other important aspect is financing, affordable and quality education for all. The requirement nationally is not only quality education, but it should be accessible and affordable to all the regions. So that is an important activity and that implementation in an explicit fashion which will really be the proof of the pudding. All that has been suggested, unless they are implemented, you're not going to achieve the results that you expect. 
Now, some reactions from important people on the policy. Our prime minister said that there's a basic difference between the current policy and the old education policy. It uh, focuses, the current policy focuses on how to think as opposed to what to think, the content and the processes. So the new education policy, according to him, is giving us the directions on how to think. Research and technology focused, quality education. He quoted here when he was releasing the policy, Abdul Kalam's uh, uh, aspiration, his dream of providing education to make quality human beings. As you know, he was a humanist and he pointed out that it should make uh, the graduates quality human beings. The next important uh, crisis, critical activity is teacher training. Uh, you know, at the moment we have a tremendous lack of competent teachers and uh, the cliche he gave was when a teacher learns, the nation leads. Therefore, create teachers who are innovative, who are able to have the competency to make the students learn. Another important point that uh, he made was that institutes to lead. In our country, we know we have uh, different levels of uh, higher education institutes. So the good ones should mentor the other institutions in order to raise their levels. This has been employed in our country to considerable advantage. When the new NITs and the IITs were uh, started, initially, you know, they required some to hold on to somebody's hand in order to move to higher levels of excellence and quality. So they had mentoring institutions, and even in TechWip, we had mentoring institutions and those that were being mentored. So within the system, to have the higher quality institutes to mentor those who are just now, just now starting. The mother tongue, which is an important uh, consideration in our country. We have 22 official languages and we have so many regional languages and uh, many political uh, 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 you know, considerations have come into play in, in terms of uh, providing the institution in uh, mother tongue. We, had, we have nationally a three language formula, a national language, Hindi, clarity. and the regional language or the mother tongue. Another important uh, recommendation, multiple exit option in, in the new policy. I will explain this at a, in a late, later stage. In some countries, for example, in Germany, students can, in a four year program, they can take the first two years, complete the program, and then leave in order to pursue other activities, including employment, then come back to the institution to complete the degree. A similar opportunity is being provided, multiple exit options. We talked about the prime minister, and here we are looking at the views of Dr. Kasuri Rangan, who was the chairman of the drafting committee. Uh, there was uh, an excellent interview of uh, Dr. Kasuri Rangan by reporters from the Mint magazine. Some of the doubts that might arise in our own minds, they asked the questions and got some clarification from the chairman. So why did you undertake the revamp of the entire structure after 34 years when the last policy was uh, promoted? Why they, at this particular time you wanted to have a new policy? So he pointed out that uh, transforming and creating a dynamic education system is fundamental for the progress of any country. You see, many changes have happened both in our own country in terms of the type of uh, uh, students which are coming into the system. And internationally, many things have happened, many innovations have happened, many um, changes have been made. So you cannot keep quiet when the whole world is changing, your own uh, the stakeholders are changing. You had to look at the policy in a, in a, in a, from a new point of view. The policy, it has been said that we need to have an open-minded approach to education. Can you explain that? He points out that uh, uh, education is multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. For example, a chartered accountant cannot just study finance. He needs to study many other things, including sociological aspects and economic aspects. And uh, the critical characters of NEP is flexibility. The other 
point they may roll a major recommendation is to allow foreign universities to set up campuses in india so the question was directed in a different uh, fashion will the powerful private college university lobby allow it to be implemented i don't think that is the point in the earlier government this was completely you know you know there were a large number of political parties which uh, vehemently opposed the setting up of foreign university uh, in india no fdi no foreign universities in india but in this uh, policy they are recommending recommending the setting up of uh, foreign universities campuses in india so he also points out uh, that we are not talking about fdi in uh, higher education we are looking at the top 100 200 500 world class institutions and in order to enrich our own education system to learn from the success stories of other countries so we would like to invite these people in order to help us the idea he says is to open our minds to excellence the other important point the number of seats in premier institutions like the iit the iims national law schools are too few for an aspirational country like india so if you enhance the strength in these institutions do you believe whether it will dilute quality so his response we have to enhance both the quantity as well as the quality at the moment we have about 900 universities and 40000 colleges under vdc what is required is to reconfigure the entire system not only to enhance uh, the quantity or the enhance the strengths so this reconfiguring of the system they have made many suggestions they have recommended that all institutions should be multidisciplinary including the iits at the moment as you know they focus on technology however even your own institution you have uh, several uh, courses and programs in the humanities and social sciences physical sciences chemical sciences and so on so i'm not so sure which is it, it is a valid uh, complaint but anyway the goal should be to restructure and not just increase the intake so you should look at this and requirement of enhancing the ger as restructuring rather than just increasing the intake then there's a really troublesome policy of a problem of mother tongue and local language as a medium of instruction there are some states like the tamil nadu where they use only the two language formula and hindi is not really welcome so the question here is whether the indian children will be at a disadvantage in a globalized world due to lack of english so he points out that the three language formula actually permits you to have uh, english in, in the curriculum what about teachers they are the pillars of an education system how do you create enough teachers and competent teachers and those who are interested in teaching this has been a problem as you know our current graduates they look for greener pastures in uh, industry and business and things like that and there are not too many bright young students who want to enter the uh, teaching profession so here the, uh, the the kind of solution that they give us teaching or teacher education will be a separate career within the university system it will not uh, happen in the teacher training institute but within a higher education university there will be a department of uh, teacher education rote learning and outdated evaluation seem to have been the problems so they are talking about more focus on the so called formative assessment as we are doing in the semester system and continuous evaluation and not depend only on a 3 hour final examination in each subject to assess the students the next issue is how do you think we can get our colleges and university to do world class research which will eventually benefit society uh he condemns uh, the current situation the research in our universities is highly unsatisfactory i must even say it is dismal when you are in the frontiers of research research uh points out that you get good teachers so in, in, you know in playing that if you are a good researcher you will also be a good teacher i wish to point out here the example of boltzmann he was a great scientist a physicist 
but students used to shudder to go to his classes, essentially because he was such a bad teacher. A National Research Foundation is being set up to address this problem. So these are the clarifications given by the chairman of the committee to some questions which might have arisen in our own minds. Here is a reality check on uh, NEP. There are six major, at least six major challenges in implementation. Let us take a look at how uh, successful the policy will be in uh, bringing, out, bringing up changes and improvements. Very important challenges. Opening universities every week, which is required if you want to increase your GER from the current 20% or so to 50%, Opening universities every week is a Herculean task. At the moment, we have about 1,000 universities and 40,000 colleges. Doubling the growth en enrollment ratio by 2035, which is just 15 years away, which is one of the stated goals of the policy, means we must open one new university every week for the next 15 years. If you do the calculation, you have come to realize this. In the school system also, the problem is similar. We need to open uh, 50 schools every week. Is that really possible? Funding is a big challenge in the COVID era. There are other sectors of uh, the economy and the country which are important and uh, whether all that money that we require will be available because education is a highly uh, um, funding intensive uh, uh, resource intensive activity. Current focus on healthcare, which is very important. We are facing the issues and economic recovery. There's also another problem which is arisen because of the lockdowns. So, you know, about 20 years, will we be able to provide enough funding for education and higher education? Next, need to create a large pool of trained teachers. We haven't been able to do this over the years and can we do this, do this in the next 15 years? Interdisciplinary higher education demands a cultural shift. And that is again, something very difficult to achieve. So these are the six uh, major issues. I would like to point out the contribution of uh, one of the architects of the plan, uh, Dr. Manjul Bhargava. He's a brilliant mathematician. He's a Fields Medal winner, Fields Medal is similar to the Nobel Prizes in the sciences and literature and so on. He works as a professor at Princeton University. He took a year's leave and joined the group here in uh, formulating NEP 2020. Now, because he comes from the US system, I mean, he's been working there as a professor, focuses on multidisciplinary education and interdisciplinary creativity. Uh, he's uh, an Indian by heart, therefore he points to the ancient Indian tradition of holistic education, Nalanda, Takshila, and things like that. Studying the sciences through the arts and the arts through the sciences, he says, I don't really understand that, but anyway, breaking silos in education, not have departmental silos, disciplinary silos, but allowing free exchange of uh, thoughts and ideas across silos. And he points out to the 21st century uh, subjects which will become important, which have already become important, artificial intelligence, machine learning, design thinking, holistic health, organic living, environmental education, and global citizenship education at relevant stages. These are important uh, uh, recommendations. I have a few comments to make. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what is the purpose of a national education policy. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, it gives the nation an opportunity to review the past and chart out a future in consonance with the emerging global environment and national aspirations. Look at the past and understand the successes and the failures, the critical issues, and uh, also look at the current environment in which education is being imparted and balance the two. And it can also be introduced to, used to introduce new features and reforms. For example, the 1986 and subsequent uh, modification 1991 policy served for the first time to combine technical and management education. 
and create AICT and the accreditation system for quality assurance. AICT, as you know, was created in 1987. The overarching intent is to revamp the higher education system. To restructure the system and consolidating the HEIs from about 1,000 universities and 40,000 colleges to about a smaller number of 15,000 high quality multidisciplinary institutions. So a given institution will become large uh, to the extent of about 20,000 uh, students per college. From, you know, we have now co colleges which have only 1,000, 2,000 and so on. IITs, uh, we had only 5,000, 3,000 we started with in initially, then to 5,000, now it is about 10,000 in individual institutions. These are to be classified into three types, combining research and teaching in different proportions. Type one with primary focus on research, type two focusing, focusing on both research and teaching and the autonomous colleges focusing on teaching. This is the new classification. They talk about the case for liberal studies. This has become a fashion to include uh, about 25% and even more, even in professional education. I point out that even in general education, you require the students to have technology literacy because we are dealing with technology every day. So it is um, more important to introduce uh, STEAM learning, STEM and STEAM, science, technology, engineering. A, they have introduced recently arts and mathematics learning into general education. Uh, even as it is, as you know, in your own college, you have about 15% liberal studies, uh, humanities and social sciences, including engineering ethics, environment science and technology, civics, constitution, sustainability, and so on. So I suggest that uh, uh, in liberal arts studies, we already have a generous proportion. Maybe we need to include a few more things, but uh, more importantly, in general education, we should include technology issues. Now, you asked me to talk about implementation also. I will take a, give you a brief uh, look on what has been done. But in general, implementation issues are so important when in 1986, uh, we uh, produced the national education policy, following year, another document was uh, produced. It was called the Program of Action. Because policy uh, is all about what to do, but actually achieving the results, how to do it and achieving the results, these are implementation issues. We have been accused um, generally that uh, while our policies are excellent, including our environment policies and so on, it is uh, an implementation that we miss out. And therefore, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the results which are supposed to be reached, they do not actually happen. Now, India is a country with a complex combination of uh, issues and problems. In order to solve them, we require wisdom and pragmatism. Now, it's a challenge to enhance, for example, the GER, basically means the student strength in uh, education system, and simultaneously ensure quality of offerings. Because in general, quality and quantity are uh -huh. uh, want to enhance the uh, quantity, quality supports. A case in point is setting up of the new IITs and NIT. A large number have been set up. I think you should uh, turn off your volume. I want to talk to each other. Okay. So initial period, we had a lot of problems. You had mentors uh, to help these uh, new institutions to stand and on their own feet and become uh, independent, uh, excellent institutions. But it has happened, actually. Therefore, there is hope for that. Resources, vitamin N. At the moment, as I said, it is about 2%, 2.5%. We want to increase it to 6%. Education is a resource. Uh, sorry, sir, I muted all. Probably your uh, audio is also muted. Please unmute yourself, sir. Hello. Right. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. The next issue is the faculty crunch. 
young people, young graduates are not interested in entering the teaching profession. We have to make teaching an attractive and challenging career option, as also give respectability to the teaching profession. Right? Governance, there are several issues. In TechWip, as you know, the first stage was enhancing the quality of undergraduate education, enhancing their employability. And, and then postgraduate education and also research. And the third aspect, which we recognize to be as important, or if not more, and the other two aspects was good governance. Okay. are not doing what they are supposed to be doing because the governance is, uh, uh, is not up to the mark. And therefore we produced a good governance guide, the so-called green book. It gave several important recommendations on how an institution should govern itself. And the transition from the old to the new should be a smooth one with no disruptions. The policy should reflect continuity with change. If that does not happen, you will go through a period of uh, enormous disruptions. The policy should include Indian cultural traditions. Apart from the internationalization or globalization of educational practices, we have our own cultural traditions which should not be uh, given a go by. And essentially, harmonious integration of education and skill development. This we have been able to do to some extent because of the two uh, frameworks. The policy must combine national aspirations and regional interests. The national objective should not be at the expense of uh, regional objectives. We should also take a look at the future and futuristic student. This planning is not only for the present, but also for the immediate and the far term future, because that is uh, we, when we educate a student to become a graduate, it takes four years and in four years, so many changes take place. So we define what is called the half-life of education. The amount of uh, time it takes for half of the inputs that we have given to the student to become obsolete. If it becomes obsolete, it, it means it is useless. So in some areas like uh, computer sciences and uh, related activities, it is said that the half-life is uh, less than the duration of uh, the program, namely, Four years, so it is about two to two years and two and a half years, and so on. Studies have been made, so you teach the students something now, and in two to two and a half years, what you have taught him has become obsolete. So it should, therefore, we should work against uh, of, of, of this uh, obsolete uh, nature of uh, education. So, NEP 1986 was followed by a program of action. So implementation is so very important. And I will say a few things about implementation and what we have been doing. I must say it is a very, uh, very promising uh, fact that uh, the Ministry of Education has taken considerable interest and in, uh, it has done a lot of things. I'll give you a list of about, uh, I mean, yeah, about 12 slides I have on that. Yes, I will now take over the second part of uh, my presentation of uh, yes I normally would take a 10 minute break at that point of time. But uh, since the time is limited, let me go on with the second part of the presentation. Uh, another 15 minutes or so I have. I have time till what? 12? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I have enough time to look at the second part of the presentation. I must point out that the Subramanian Committee, the earlier policy drafting committee, they have made several recommendations. Not all of them have been accommodated in the new policy. Uh, some of them have been, but uh, the, because the focus has changed, that, uh, that, that policy recommended an Indian education service, just like the Indian uh, administrative service. And 6% of GDP was also pointed out by them. They also wanted a teacher entrance test should be made compulsory for recruitment of all teachers. Then a national level test for uh, competitive examinations 
an onboard board exam should be introduced, they pointed out. Then the midday meal scheme. Uh, if you remember, it started with uh, M.G. Ramachandran when he was the chief minister of Tamil Nadu. Uh, he introduced it uh, with a considerable amount of thought because in addition to education, these students uh, required nutrition uh, because there were, there were many levels of malnutrition and anemia. Now the midday meal scheme, which was pointed out, should also be expanded to the higher classes. This was essentially for primary education, even for uh, secondary education and so on. And uh, the top 200 foreign universities should be allowed to set up campuses. This uh, recommendation has been accepted. Now the expert opinions are people who have an influence on making uh, changes and policies and so on. What they have said on NEP 2020, we have looked at the prime minister and the chairman of the committee. I'll give you a few more uh, perspectives. Then I'll look at NEP implementation and contemporary issues in higher and technical education. I will not have time to look at these things, but I will leave them with you because these issues in addition to what the national education policy has attempted to solve these are all extremely important in terms of uh, general policy changes i pointed out that manjal gabargava one of the architects oh, of the and he has made some uh, uh, statements about the state of education in our country some of them i believe are uh, very drastic but i leave you to make your own judgments for example, he points out that uh, in India, often teachers are given just given a book and told to teach page by page. Such autonomy is there in other countries for teachers to innovate, be creative, and learn the latest. Unfortunately, it is not there in the system in India, which requires cultural change. I believe that he is talking about uh, primary education in this respect, not so much higher education, where we have a considerable amount of autonomy to frame the curriculum and also to decide upon the pedagogical as, uh, strategy. Multidisciplinary education, he has pointed out is extremely important and the silos between uh, disciplines should be uh, removed. Interdisciplinary creativity of the student must be uh, exploited and therefore the holistic education he has pointed out. The other important thing is students should be able to choose curricula, namely the subjects and skill sets as per the choice as well as interest. In fact, to give an example of physics and music to be taught together, uh, um, this happens in the US, of course, but whether it is uh, amenable for implementation in India, I don't know. Then uh, the Latest subjects that should be introduced according to him, which is a very important fang, is artificial intelligence, design thinking, holistic health, organic living, environmental education, and global citizenship education at relevant stages. Some comments about other people who, natural, who, who repeatedly talk about education, they, 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 they are dissatisfied with the current state of affairs. One is Gurtharan Das, who was chairman of Procter & Gamble. Oh, he came from business and he wrote a book called India Grows at Night. Very interesting book. What does that mean, India Grows at Night? Because the uh, bureaucracy is uh, in bed, bureaucracy is sleeping. During the day, they come in uh, the, uh, uh, come, the, the influence policies which are against what uh, should be called progressive policies. So when they are in bed, they are no longer working on uh, and, and preventing good things from happening. That is the objective of that book. So he makes a case for the importance of private education. I'm sure you would be interested in this, both in terms of school education as well as uh, higher education. Uh, at the moment, we know that in school education, about 50% of it happens in private schools. In higher education, about 75 to 80% of it happens in the private sector. Now, one of the myths it points out is that education must only be delivered by the government if it is to serve the public good. Uh, I pointed out earlier, curbing commercialization and private players are associated with the commercialization of higher education. 
um, there are very serious checks and balances which are which have been proposed uh, to uh, look at this issue not so much for encouraging private uh, players to play an important role and he says that uh, there is it is a hypocritical lie which forbids them from making a profit when everyone knows the that most in fact do uh, profit in terms of public education is the uh, the the excess of uh, income over expenditure internationally he points out that uh, in many countries like the us the uk and even socialist scandinavian countries they have a hybrid system they are publicly funded but privately run uh, we have our own classification but this is something that he points out is the ideal combination and allowing foreign universities to set up campuses in india in the earlier government as you know excuse me they were only allowed to have uh, partnerships and collaborations but at the moment they are allowed to set up campuses in the country because we would like to import um, enhanced levels of excellence okay, in, in okay. education at the moment there are a couple of uh, foreign universities we have campuses in india virginia tech has a campus uh, close to chennai but uh, they are uh, allowed to run uh, post graduate programs and uh, research programs rather than undergraduate program but with this policy uh, formulation now i am sure that it will help them to uh, set up more campuses the international experience of foreign universities setting up campuses for instance in many countries like uh, malaysia um, the middle eastern countries and so on not all of them have been successful some of them have closed down and they have gone back so it is not always uh, a successful experiment but uh, now we will be uh, starting to do these experiments the former director of triple it delhi uh, he, he has uh, looked at uh, the policy and he points out that uh, essentially what we are the policy is trying to tell us is consolidation of higher education institutions as i pointed out uh, a minimum of about 20000 students and multidisciplinary therefore you will combine institutions together creation of large multidisciplinary universities and a national research foundation as we have pointed out and again the classification of universities into research universities teaching universities and colleges and we have looked at uh, the reality check earlier and so i won't go through that but there are very serious issues now let me come to actual implementation implementation timelines of 11 key nep recommendations in school on higher education sector this uh, have already started to happen and uh, many of the reforms do not require funding but a new way of thinking for example the multiple entry and exit is not related to funding but to modular courses and credit bank and so it can be done this is what kare uh, who is the education secretary pointed out here are some of the key recommendation and the likely implementation timelines higher education is what we are looking at multiple exit and entry points into higher education will be available they say from 2020 to 21 within the coming year four year programs will be introduced by 2021 for central universities to start with and for others by 2022 nep allows the higher education institutes to offer undergraduate degree that can be either three or four year duration with multiple exit op op options within a year again if you remember delhi university had a serious crisis when uh, the vice chancellor uh, he, he suggested the uh, um, starting of courses of four year undergraduate courses of four year duration people said that it was to enable uh, the students to match with the requirements in the us system and it adds nothing to the indian system lot of problems it was uh, i don't think it was really implemented but the new policy talks about four year undergraduate programs and this they call uh, a uh, research experience we'll take a look at it later on so what are these multiple options a certificate after completing one year in a discipline or field including vocational and professional areas a three year program for instance 
the first year you complete and you leave with the certificate and with a, an opportunity to come back to complete the degree uh, which is the terminal degree uh, in another two years. A diploma after two years of study or a bachelor's degree after a three-year program. Four-year program will be an multidisciplinary program and uh, it will have uh, research experience as one of the components. Academic Bank of Credit, ABC, will be established. Therefore, you can bank the number of credits that you have uh, earned and that will um, enable you to complete the program after uh, you have completed a certain number of uh, research. As I said, the degree with research for the four-year program. Common entrance tests will be worked out by February or March 2021 and administered possibly by May 2021, that is next year. And the National Testing Agency as a premier testing agency will help in the administering of uh, these tests. The important thing, the common entrance exam shall test conceptual understanding and the ability to apply knowledge and shall aim to eliminate the need for taking coaching for these exams. Because as you know, the coaching classes are often uh, criticized uh, for giving an undue advantage to those who can afford it. And although also the universities are constant competition with the coaching classes in terms of uh, the examinations and the results. And Indian institutions setting up campuses abroad and allowing foreign universities to set up campuses in India implementation dates are unclear. Still a lot more thinking needs to be done. Achieving 50% GER, including vocational education by 2035. The NEP suggests many things which are common sense suggestions. Underserved regions to be, have more of these institutions and to enhance the existing strength uh, in, in, in uh, existing institutions. Uh, and as I pointed out earlier, the implementation is a nightmare. You need to start uh, every week so many institutions. And a national professional standards for teachers, similar to Subramaniam Committee, which su suggested national entrance test. Therefore, there will be a national professional standards for teachers and teacher education will be given in within a higher education institution to by 1922 they feel that uh, this can be done. National Research Foundation, work in progress, some more things have to be done, but uh, the funding required for uh, this, uh, uh, four major divisions, NRF will have sciences, technology, social sciences, and humanities and arts, and an annual grant of 20,000 crore uh, with autonomy over its finances and governance. That's a large amount of money. And the groups of experts that come together for implementation, the terms of reference I have indicated here, the important terms of reference, each of which will allow us to uh, fulfill the implementation of uh, the policy. A study by Fortune magazine established that 90% of, I will give some time for questions and answers also in a minute, 90% of unsuccessful strategies are because of weak execution. We know that, weak implementation. Now, our NEP 2020 has a vision to transform completely the Indian education system. There are four contributors to policy failure. It is a, this is a think tank which has uh, come up with this uh, idea. Overly optimistic expectations, implementation in dispersed governance, inadequate collaborative policy making, and vagaries of the political cycle. When uh, another party takes a charge at the center uh, on, and in the States, for example, their ideas will be different, may be different. And there is a five point implementation plan that is suggested by another think tank. Indian's task force on higher education reforms. We need to set up this task force to act as an advisory body comprising experts from public and private education institutions. An implementation standing committee uh, to be formulated to consist of selected uh, vice chancellors and directors and so on. And this committee should be located within the this is a suggestion, Ministry of Education and chaired by the education minister and the mem member secretary to be the education secretary. A national education ministers council, because the education and higher education are in the concurrent list, 
we need to get the cooperation of uh, uh, all states and UTs, and therefore education ministers of uh, these states and UTs uh, will, should be in a committee chaired by the Union Minister for Education. Another interesting suggestion, integrating institutions of eminence with NEP, they must be tasked with the responsibility of working towards the implementation of this policy. As you know, at the moment, uh, we have 10 public and 10 private institutions which have been characterized by, as uh, institutions of eminence. The public uh, institutions like some of the IITs and so on, they will be given extra funding to work towards becoming uh, globally excellent institutions to come under the ranking list. And uh, the private institutions, of course, they have to provide the funds from their own uh, kitty. So 10 plus 10, they have been suggested, they have been identified, and these should work with the national education policy. So this is the suggestion. And the National Higher Education Philanthropy Council, because a lot of money is required, and uh, as in other countries, private donations will assist in uh, the uh, implementation of the policy. As you know, we already have uh, assessed, which is uh, uh, which all the industries have to go. I have to pay, and this is the um, th th this is a, a fund that uh, uh, all the industry have to pay two to two and a half percent, and that should be rooted through the this philanthropy council. This suggestion. In conclusion of uh, this uh, particular uh, idea of the think tank for successful implementation, it points out that the, the, the term I was looking for was the corporate social responsibility that uh, many industries, for example, have used education as the avenue to actually spend this money. So for successful implementation, what are the requirements? Create stakeholder incentives, formulate instruments in the form of legal policy, regulatory and institutional mechanisms. Still a lot more uh, legal uh, requirements are, are there. For example, repealing of the AICT and the UGC Act and then incorporating them into the uh, larger body. Build reliable information repositories, develop adaptability across HEIs, regulatory bodies and government agencies to work together, develop credibility through transparent actions and participation of all stakeholders and develop sound principles of management. So that is the implementation uh, details at the, as of now. And I have some more uh, slides, I'll leave them with you. And you will see that uh, there, is, there are a lot of challenges in higher education, particularly in order for us to enhance the quantity, enhance the uh, number of uh, uh, students and institutions, at the same time, retaining the required quality. So I will stop now, we still have about 10 to 15 minutes for any feedback or questions and I'll, I'm happy to uh, engage with you. Thank you, sir, uh, <coughs> for your uh, nice and detailed presentation. Now I request uh, participants to raise your hand so that I will uh, unmute you and you can ask the questions. Meanwhile, I request Dr. Yavi Ratan Prasad Garu to interact with uh, Professor Natarajan Garu. Sir, as a, uh, a very nice and elaborative presentation, sir, uh, particularly uh, with reference to the implementation of this new education policy 2020 in order to make uh, the Indian higher education system more uh, vibrant and uh, uh, creative, to make creative individuals. My, I got small doubts, sir, because now this uh, policy as uh, initiated or uh, it is going to make the existing universities and colleges into three categories that is uh, teaching teaching come research and research institutions and also they want to make the existing institutions uh, to come out of this affiliation system uh, in this case at what point of time the government uh, or the mhrd will initiate uh, to make the institutions as a standard institutions can you just to uh, give a small focus on this, sir. Uh, essentially, what do you, what is the, uh, the point that you are making, uh, Professor Ratna Prasad? Uh, for example, if you take our institution, suppose uh, 
in the current scenario there will be certain limitations from the government uh, that is state government or affiliating uh, that is university system uh, under these circumstances suppose if we want to become a stand alone institution uh, under category 2 something like teaching teaching come research institution at what point of time we will get this uh, flexibility to opt uh, from ugc or mhrd something like that now there are many changes that uh, are uh... being proposed and as i said that some of them have already been made first uh-huh. of all the mhrd is now the ministry of education okay then uh, see autonomy you are already autonomous yes sir they would yes. like at the moment as i pointed out there are only about 20% of our institutions which are autonomous okay if 100% autonomy see autonomy is a complex thing it uh-huh. has to be given and it has to be taken uh-huh. it has to be given by the affiliating university and the state government in many cases and mm-hmm. it has to be taken by, by the institution because it is an additional responsibility as you know yes. you have to conduct your own examinations you have to declare your results and you're responsible and you're accountable to the public exactly. now mm-hmm. remember when the rcs were being transformed into nits which essentially means rcs was an affiliated institution mm-hmm. and nit is a autonomous institution Mm-hmm. i was a part of a committee we went around the southern part of india to different states and the faculty and the staff were extremely against uh, this uh, acquiring of autonomy correct so the mindset change that has to happen across the country correct very important mm-hmm. so once that is done you know every state government is now setting up uh, task forces Mm. to align themselves to the national policy okay uh, i think your state must have also started doing this okay. at which you will have an opportunity to indicate uh, the difficulties of implementation and what enabling features you have to uh, your your state government has to provide so that is an opportunity for you to uh, ask for enabling factors okay okay sir thank you sir anyone else vasvi madam sir, do you have any question sir good afternoon sir yes sir i have a small question sir like uh, see uh, is there any kind of uh, uh, proposals for this multidisciplinary education sir because now uh, we are offering like a, a minor major uh, uh, some honor so in that case uh, Uh, whether there will be any case like multidisciplinary and uh, uh, will be be modeled as a research institute or something like that sir you see the important example that i can give you is okay. that uh, uh, at the moment we have uh, technical universities medical universities agricultural universities and so on they will all go they will all become part of a multidisciplinary so single discipline uh, institutions they are discouraging Okay, yes, sir. One more uh, point, sir. I am a professor Ratna Prasad. Yes. As a part of this NEP 2020, there is one. I felt there is one important uh, parameter that is motivated, energized, and capable faculty. Uh, for example, in the current uh, uh, system of uh, this uh, identification recruitment. Uh, promotion and empowerment of faculty uh, from joining to the till retirement in india there is a uh, more or less a fixed system is there but if you want to motivate and energize the faculty with the uh, uh, relevant skills and as well as the innovation coming out of this faculty are they going to bring any kind of system incorporated or embedded in the, into the policy that means Uh, i read this to the policy document suppose if you want to energize if you want to motivate what kind of incentive mechanism you are going to officially bring out or we the institutions or universities have to make on, the, on our own i think it is preferable to have uh, your own flexibility adaptability and freedom to do these things okay uh, even now as you know the curri- as far as the curriculum is concerned aict proposes only model curriculum right and you have the freedom to adapt it to suit your needs right and what uh, i think some guidelines i think might come 
okay. to show what uh, enabling features will help this to happen. Okay, okay. Because till now it is a fixer system. Uh, we'll, we'll mean what, uh, what do you mean? Uh, the tenure you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, tenure plus also incentivizer system. There is no incentivizer system in the current uh, uh, policies of uh, this uh, article and employment, promotions, uh, the pay structure and etc. and etc. Mm. That is uh, the pay scales and things like that. There may be an influence, but uh, I do not know whether you would want that to happen. Mm. That at the top, somebody prescribing that, uh, that these are the in incentives you give. For example, for research publications, you have your own system. Nobody is telling you how much and how, how you yes, should yes, do it. Yes, yes, that we are doing, sir. That yeah. we are doing. How much do you give for research paper in a Scopus Index journal? Uh, in, in our institution, it varies from 5,000 to 15,000, sir. I see. Depending upon the quality of publication, either in Scopus or SCI, IEEE transactions, and also depends upon the impact factor given by the Thomson Reuters. So, uh, you have a graded system for different impact factors. You have a graded system? Uh, not many impact factors, but uh, depending upon the, the quality of journal, either it is SCI index or Scopus index, or if it is IEEE transaction, it takes more time for review and publication, we pay more, something like that. You have your own system? Yeah, yeah. You know, and also, and also we, have, we have incentivized the research funding. Somebody gets any grant from DST or UGC or DBT or CSIR, we, incent we are incentivizing them again. Yeah, because in the grants, there is no provision for uh, remuneration. Honorary. Yes, exactly. That's what. That's what. Uh, like some of the foreign universities argue, is it already uh, bringing some kind of system where uh, there is a flexible component? or there is a fixed company, something like that, are you going to incorporate? Yes, for my, my doubt, I'm asking. Have, have, have your incentives yielded results in terms of enhanced research and enhanced quality of research publications? Definitely, sir. Definitely. Yeah. For the last, this uh, we have, based on the experience and uh, the exposure we got to take up activities and interaction with people like you, we have made a, our strategy plan in 2016. We made a four years plan. Yes. There is a lot of difference in the improvement in terms of quality of the outcome of the faculty as well as students as are now over the first four years. Excellent, excellent. There is a there is a phenomenal growth, in fact. Good, very good. Any, okay, other any more questions from the participants? You can okay. unmute yourself and ask questions. I have one more question, sir. Yes. Sir, hello? Yes, yes. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have one more question. So sure. what, is, what is the role of this regulatory system, sir? Regulatory bodies like uh, higher education, will it be like a state-wise or uh, uh, for the entire country, only one regulatory body? Or, no, as you know, even AICT and UGC, while it is a central body located in the New Delhi, they have their regional offices, they have regional committees and so on. It has to be a decentralized system. Okay. But even AICT and UGC will now come under an umbrella regulatory body for the whole country. Okay. And many other disciplines also will be merged into this, but they will have their own verticals. Uh, in, for example, technical education, it will be an organization like AICT, but then it will be, it may be called something different, okay. but it, it will have the same functional responsibilities. It has to be a decentralized system. And since we are an affiliated institute, sir, uh, what could be the role of our uh, university, sir, Jayanti Kaknada? Okay. Uh, can you speak a little louder and can you please repeat the question? I couldn't get it. Uh, what will be the role of our affiliated university, sir, JNTU Kaknada? We are uh, currently affiliated to the universities. So in this new educational kind of thing, uh, what could be the role of the affiliated universities, sir? Because everything is autonomous now. In, in fact, I am talking about uh, uh, affiliated uh, institutions. So we are already an affiliated in, um, uh, autonomous institution. Autonomous, yes, sir. Institution. So we have a great deal of freedom. The um, university will probably play a coordinating role. 
uh, because you are in charge of your curriculum development, you are in charge of assessment, and you are in charge of admissions. Yes. There may be some common uh, features that need to be uh, coordinated by the university system, but uh, the suggestion is ultimately in the near or far future, each of your institutions will be a mini university. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I request uh, Dr. Praveen Naidu to present a vote of thanks. Praveen Naidgar, please go ahead. I do. Are you there? Okay, I take all the responsibility of presenting a lot of thanks. On behalf of uh, Institution Innovation Council and the Department of Civil Engineering, I thank Professor R. Natarajan, sir, for uh, his wonderful presentation and for enlightening us on this new education policy. And also Dr. Yavi Ratnaprasad Garu for giving us this opportunity. And Dr. Prasad Ras Garu, our R&D <coughs> convener, and uh, our, my esteemed colleagues for uh, extending their cooperation and their students. Uh, all of you, uh, big thank you for this uh, event to, to make a big success. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Professor Ratnaprasad. Uh, thank you, sir. We will be again in touch in the near future on some of the topics which are which you are interested to deliver and interact with the faculty. Uh, in fact, uh, we have been continuously inviting uh, uh, eminent people like you uh, to deliver on the advanced technologies or the uh, technic techniques or skills required for the faculty in the 21st century to uh, impart the same thing to our students and to make them better in the global competition. Uh, once again, and thank you, sir. I will again uh, be in touch with you in the near future, sir. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. I'll leave now. Ah, thank, thank you, sir. Bye. Okay, sir. I'm closing the meeting, sir. Thank you, yeah. sir. Thanks. Thanks. Bye -bye.